do you ever think you'd see the gym get to a level of popularity where lads would opt for a workout on a Friday night over? You know what? Friday? I was talking to a friend of mine recently about this. It's become trendy yeah. to be in the gym, you know? Which is good. Um, yeah, no, we, I think which is very positive, you know? And now people meet their partners or boyfriend or girlfriends or whatever it may be is in gyms. Yeah. One, one of the biggest growing trend in, in clothing is a, what's called at leisure. So leisure wear that people wear outside. But back in the day, if you wore a tracksuit, if you weren't going to train or whatever, you were seen as a bit of a scoby or something that's... Absolutely. But, uh, now I think it's it's more mainstream, which I think is hugely positive. Um, but yeah, no, definitely I think it's more, more focused now to be looked after yourself, mental health, you know, physical well-being. And people are doing it for different reasons, which I think is yeah. it's great. It's good. It's not just for biceps and, and, and uh, no. you know, abs is more for mental health and well-being and you know outgas and a bit of stuff where the pub used to be the, the go-to for a lot of people this is a different different venture different avenue which i think is it can be positive but like everything it can be used to extremes as well yeah i just think in terms of virus culture it's definitely a positive shift uh, away from the garden and into the into the gym um i i actually if you look at it if you look at the growth of social media it almost tracks the growth and popularity of the gym so stuff stuff like instagram um, which has just become unbelievably popular. In around the same time, just got an influx of trainers into the industry. Loads of people getting into gym, especially young people. Um, and they're, they're following these people on these social media platforms. Uh, let's say they have a six pack and they just equate that six pack to qualifications, experience, credibility. And they follow this guy and they go, oh, this guy has a six pack, he knows what he's talking about. So I'm going to do their plan. Now the issue with that is, these guys come up with this six week plan with no specificity. Um, and it's like, who's this plan for? Is it for the, the trainer who used to be a bodybuilder or is it for the 34 four year old with a couple of, couple of kids, a demanding job, uh, mortgage and bills to pay. Uh, and they skip the basics. So they skip over the sleep, the relationships with food, building relationships with food, movement, hydration, and they just go into this crazy, high intensity, high frequency training, low carb the shit out of them, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm pulled back to like, who is this plan for? And it's rarely for the individual that they get in to, to these groups or, or, or that they manage to hook on the sale and get them involved in these plans. Um, and it, it's frustrating then because people that get involved in this, they follow this plan that works and it works for who, and then they fail. And then they fall back on the, I tried a personal trainer, tried the gym, didn't work for me. But yet they never address the basics. So I suppose for you, what are the basics of fat loss and how important are they in, in trying to nail them? So, so I'm going to try not to get on my soapbox here, Kieran. I know, yeah, yeah. I triggered it, you on. Right, but you, you, you hooked me in there. So one of my major issues is I have, I'm in, I'm in the clinic here in Malahoy at the moment and, and I have more physique competitors, more, you know, you know, bikini model girls coming to see me that look shredded, that are not happy, they're not healthy. So this this aspiration of getting abs or, or you know, they do their meal prep and I see what's going on, but I know they're taking steroids. I know at the weekend they're doing cocaine and doing all this sort of stuff to balance themselves out. I seen this guy taking shitloads of steroids and then he's dropped back down again and he's suicidal, he's not sleeping, he can't have them relationship he's in his house the whole weekend he's got these problems so unfortunately what what, uh, what social media do is they, they show you you know one facet so you're taking a picture of the grand prix and no one's going to win the race it's one snapshot and people are only sharing what they like so in my opinion and it's my, my humble opinion bodybuilders and, and power lifters and weight lifters there any recommendation from those three classification of people and i'd actually need to put crossfit into that um, athletes in that um, um, umbrella so we have crossfit athletes we have bodybuilders we have power lifters and we have um, them power lifters no executive no general pop client should ever take advice from those categories yeah. because that's their job that's yeah. their no, I'm not going to be taking running distances from Mo Farah because I'm, I'm not a long distance runner. I'm not going to be taking bodybuilding techniques from Ronnie Coleman because that's not my world at all. So yeah. for some reason, for some godforsaken reason, we take 
these four disciplines as gospel for our executive clients and that just doesn't work it no. just doesn't you know when you've got kids when you've got dehydration issue when you've got a job when you've got travel when you've got jet lag when you've got emails to do at 10 o'clock at night and meetings to jump online in hong kong or, or china or or, or, or America, your time zones are all over the place. So for me, the recommendation from these people is just, it's pure and utter non-specific. It's non-specific. Yeah. And for me, I have this simple principle. I call it the GTI principle. You have to have a goal. You have to test the relevant person. And then you have the information or intelligence to give them a recommendation. So I, this is the thing. Online coaching is big. I get that. I know where it's going. I don't particularly like online coaching because not that everyone does it the same way. It tends to be a, a cookie cutter approach where everyone gets this, you know, calorie deficit, gets this, you know, hit training, gets this, you know, body weight training on this running outside. And it's not specific to the client. Yeah. to their ergonomics, to their, their, their biomechanics, to their strength, to their history, to their medical, you know, um, journey they've had in life. So for me, I, I think it's, when you say, you say basics, and I, I, I agree with you, but I nearly say fundamentals. Yeah, so, yeah, fu fundamentals. Uh, the boring mentals. People, people don't like hearing the word fundamentals because they think, that they automatically think that, oh, this mm -hmm. fellow stripped me right back to, to simplistic shit here. But, yeah. but if you don't, have them how can you put your body in a position where it, it can facilitate the fat loss process um, and, and yeah and, and 100 and what i say to people is and i like to keep things desmond street simple as a friend of mine says if you can imagine a car right so so what age are you now kieran 31 31 right you're an alpha right so, so if i said to you i'm going to give you one car when you turn 17 or 18 and that's the only car you're ever going to have for the rest of your life yeah. You're going to look after that bad boy. You're going to polish it and, yeah, look yeah. In service and make sure everything's aligned. For some reason, when people at the age of 40, 45, 50 go to a trainer, they put them on a program that they would give someone that's 20. And in my opinion, and very much so in my business model, all my business model is one-to-one -one training. Yeah. And I have, I, I would say, less than 1% of my clients are in their 20s, mm -hmm. right? So a lot of those people don't have the money to come to a personal trainer three or four times a week. They don't have exposable income. They're saving for house or whatever it may be. So the majority of my clients are 45 plus and more percentage of those are females and males. Having said that, we have a mix of guys from athletes as well. So the fact is when you put a program together, it has to be specific to where that person is on their journey in life, what mileage they've accumulated. And that mileage might be from a biomechanical point of view, it might be from an or orthopedic or a knee or an ankle or a hip point of view, but it also can be from maybe this guy played rugby when he was in school and college and he's got a good frame on him. Maybe we have to, you know, suit that. Or maybe this female did a lot of running before she came to see you. So maybe we, we can, we can lean on that. Or maybe this person has four kids or they've had a hysterectomy or they have a very heavy period cycle or they've got sleep uh, apnea or insomnia. So that's who you look after. You don't take recommendations off the internet and say, I'm going to get this guy. I'm going to do this and do this and do this. It's, it's not going to work. So for me, it's all about the assessment. It's all about the coaching. It's all about the personalization. And that's why I went down the road of function medicine. That's why I went down the road of sports, nutrition, and physical therapy. Because if all you have is a hammer, everything is a nail. So I can get you in the gym and I can smash you in the gym. No problem. And I can do that day in, day out. That gets me nowhere. Because what happens is in the gym, all we do in the gym is we ask a question. That's all we're doing. Get bigger, get leaner, get stronger, get more flexible. And then after the gym, our body may or may not have the homeostatic balance to adapt to the training stimulus. We get bigger, we get leaner, we get stronger. But if we're not eating, we're not sleeping, we're not hydrated, we're not recovering, that just doesn't happen. Yeah. So I like to say to people, imagine your mobile phone. When you get up in the morning, your mobile phone's at 100%. Every single app you want to use in your phone, no matter how sophisticated that app is, it will work. But if your app only, oh, your phone only is 15%, that, that phone is going to only use what it needs to use to get it through the day. So people put a lot of work on top of their body when they don't actually have the resilience. They don't have the metabolic function. They don't have the hormonal status. They don't have the, the mitochondrial function to adapt to that training. So it's, it's too much too soon. So you say fund basics, I say fundamentals. Yeah. Some people say foundations. It doesn't matter. But the fact is people are putting the fancy roof on when the house hasn't even got a solid foundation. Yeah, you, you'd mentioned there uh, homeostasis, which for people that don't know, it's the body's ability to kind of maintain a balance. Um, 
there's a hierarchy of needs within the body. Yeah. It's, it's not going to shift fat or it's not going to build muscle if it's not getting enough sleep. And that's caused some form of, well, it, it's, it's inevitably going to cause issues with hormones. It, it could potentially cause digestive issues. Um, so with the body looking to achieve this homeostasis, again, if we, we strip it back to one of the core fundamentals, um, how can sleep impact on your ability to, to shift weight? Okay, so, so sleep, this is one of the things that was, I think maybe two years ago now, I, I decided to do, uh, no, sorry, I did a presentation two years ago. So about four years leading up to that, I knew I was going to do this presentation. So I, I read every single book on the planet. I, myself and Dr. Serrano, we went through a lot of literature review. I contacted leading experts all around the world on sleep. And I contacted a few places in Ireland to do, do a sleep analysis. Mm. Sleep, oh my God, what happens in the dark will manifest in the light. So if you don't get good restorative sleep, every process that takes place in the daytime is interfered with in any way, shape or form. So for example, for you, let's say you said, you said to one of your clients, here is breakfast A, it's a gold star, it's 100%, you are a saint if you eat this breakfast. If you wake up in the morning and you've had interrupted sleep, if you wake up and you haven't had enough restorative sleep and you go and have that superstar breakfast, the body will not respond the same way to it as if it had a quality night's sleep. And how, how I explain that is in your stomach, we have, a, we have our, our pancreas to the side. And what our pancreas does is, I don't think of it like a digestive lab. It makes insulin, the glucagon, it also makes digestive enzymes. So when we eat food, the body says, here's some enzymes that I made last night. Digest your food, Kira, no problem. We'll manage that. However, if we ingest our food and our, and our pancreas doesn't have these enzymes, but then they're like, oh, shit. He's after eating some food. Let's make some lipase. Let's make some uh, pepsinogen. Let's make some of this. Let's make some of that. And unfortunately, it's too late. Gotcha. And then we have this blood sugar fluctuation up and down. So when we should be in homeostasis, when we should be balanced, our body is reactive. And the key thing that sleep does is it makes the body responsive. The body is ready to take on the day. But if we don't get restored to sleep, our regeneration, if you want to think of it, I like to think of it like, like our cells in our body. We've over you know, trillions of cells in our body. And what we have is we have little factories. And those factories are skin factories, nail factories, lung factories, liver factories. And at nighttime, they clean out all the rubbish they've accumulated at daytime. They get themselves ready for the next day and they get the engines ready. So then when food comes in, they're ready to go. But unfortunately, we, we have what's called circadian clock dysfunction. And circadian clock dysfunction is where we, our clocks are not in tune. So think of those factories. They don't know whether they should be starting or shut or closing. They should be cleaning or doing some maintenance. They don't know what's going on. And then they're getting through. And you know this as well. I'm sure you've got loads, loads of clients. And maybe it's happened to you. Two things that will dramatically impact your success in the gym is illness and injury. The body will break itself down. It will break protein down because protein is needed for growth, repair, detoxification, and immune function. So the minute that you are, are sick, protein will be broken down by your muscle mass. But if you're not getting enough sleep, your body is chasing itself. You're never going to be in balance. So getting sleep not only makes you feel more satisfied from your food straight off the bat. So we have leptin and ghrelin, our hormones that make us feel full and make us feel uh, hungry. And th these are more in balance with sleep. Our digestion is much better when we've got good sleep from an enzymatic function point of view. Mm -hmm. Blood sugar control is better when we have good sleep. Then our brain function. In our brain, we have, a, we have um, I'm sure you've, you've heard of the lymphatic system. Yes. The lymphatic system is a sanitation system of the body and people get lymphatic massage and so on. But what it does is it's so, sort of like the bin collectors, collects all the rubbish from the body. We have a special one in our brain. It's called the glymphatic system. So imagine your brain is this size and around your brain, you have the cerebrospinal fluid. At nighttime, the neurons shrink by up to 40%. So it actually allows us to shampoo our brain with this cerebrospinal fluid and get rid of any plaque, any debris that was built up. Now, that only happens in deep phase of sleep and if you've got continuous sleep. So if, you, if you've woken up multiple times in the nighttime, you're actually not replenishing your brain. So your body will feel eh, okay, but you feel fatigued, you feel lethargic, you feel brain fog, you don't feel as sharp, you walk into rooms, forget where you walked in, remember numbers, your creativity, your mood, your libido are all compromised. And this is all because of sleep. And as my friend says, one sweet doesn't give you a cavity. So yes, I'm sure you've woke up in the morning and felt a bit, a bit of shit. Ah, Becky, I have to go to work. But females, particularly females, females just get up and go. 
Yeah. Because mommy has to do her job, has to do her, you know, help everybody else out. And then they're eroding themselves. So every morning they're waking up at 30 or 40% and they just suck it up. And meanwhile, the body is breaking down. They're putting on weight. Why are they putting on weight? Because when they eat certain foods, they're not metabolizing it. The blood sugar goes up, they're storing it as fat. Then when they do go to eat a protein meal or a meal with fat in it, because their digestive system is like, oh, I can't handle that, they steer away from it. So I, I checked the majority of women's bloods. They're anemic. Like if you're anemic, you cannot lose weight. Let me say that again. If you're anemic, you cannot lose weight. You can't even get oxygen to the cells of your body. You get dizzy when you stand up. You get bloating in your belly. You get, ooh, you feel full after having only a small bit of food. You go long gaps without eating. You're dehydrated. You're not going to the bathroom. All these things are telling you that the internal clocks in your body, the internal factories need to be addressed. And they're not addressed by cutting calories. They're not addressed by overtraining. And they're not addressed by not looking at your sleep, your nutrition, and so on. So they're not addressed by the two things everybody's doing. That's uh, exactly calorie, right. calorie deficit and trying to shit out of themselves. Um, you, you just mentioned, you'd mentioned uh, the importance of restorative sleep. Uh, how much sleep? Okay, so this, this is a really good book. It just came out. It's called Exercised by, uh, I'm going to say Daniel Lieberman. Well, that could be wrong, but it's called Exercised either way. So sleep is something that I, I focus on a lot. And they say there's no magic number. Well, actually, he's coming out saying there is a magic number. Seven is the magic number. So unfortunately, a lot of the research that came in with sleep is that more sleep can be better for you or more sleep can actually be it can be more related to uh, comorbidities. But unfortunately that was done on people in hospitals who sleep a lot more anyway. So the rule is between six to seven hours of continuous restorative sleep. So for you, you might do very well I'm getting six hours continuous sleep. Somebody else might get seven hours continuous sleep, but it's about continuous sleep and waking up refreshed. If you have to wake up and hit the snoozer, you're in trouble straight off the bat. Mm -hmm. The second thing is on top of sleep um, time or quality and, and restoration is what we call sleep hygiene. The routine has to be the same. So if you get to bed at X amount of time and you get up at X, you need to keep that throughout the week. And there used to be a train of thought which was called a sleep deficit. And the sleep deficit basically means that let's say Monday to Friday, I'm in work at seven in the morning. I get up at six, I have my breakfast shower, I get to work. And then at the weekend, I sleep in. The problem is that causes social jet lag and that causes the clocks to go off. So inside your body, as I said, those factories expect to start at a certain time and end at a certain time. But they don't know Monday to Sunday. They and don't know Saturday to Sunday. Lost sleep. They, they, and this is the thing. The factories that need to be rebuilt on a Tuesday night cannot be you know, repaired on a Sunday. It just doesn't happen. That needs to happen then. It didn't happen then. It, we can sort of hopefully make do a little bit with a restoration the weekend, but it still didn't take place. So the answer is set, seven is the key number. More focus is, is continuous sleep, with making sure you wake up refreshed. And the next thing is sleep hygiene, routine between getting up and going to bed at night time. And a good sign is, if your sleep is good, this is a very simple thing for your listeners, is within 20 minutes, they should be asleep when they go to bed. Um, and they should be fully awake within an hour. If you need coffee, you need something to get yourself going in the morning, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if it takes any more than an hour, we have what's called a CAR, a cortisol awakening response. And a cortisol is crucial to come up in the morning. If your cortisol is like this in the morning, that's not a good sign. We should have a good cortisol awakening response. And that's someone that wakes up and within 20, maximum 60 minutes, they're, they're, they're flying. Yeah, this, this I'm probably going off on tangent here, but you mentioned cortisol. Um, <clears throat> so cortisol should be high in the morning, so it wakes you up. And then throughout the rest of the day, there should be a drop off, so you're ready to go to sleep. Yeah. People with chronically high levels of cortisol, um, is, is that a contributing factor towards the tired and wired kind of person? Yeah, so, so what we have is, um, I, I did a course, I actually recorded that course I, I gave on sleep. So what we have is we've got two X's, right? So when you wake up in the morning, your cortisol should be high and get high soon. And then as the day goes on, it should go down, right? That's one core. That's curve, okay, we call that curve C, pr process C, cortisol goes down. Then we have what's called process S. Process S is sleep drive. You should have a low urgency to go back to bed in the morning and you should have a high urgency to go to bed at night time. So low one for bed, high one for bed. Low one for bed, high one for bed. High cortisol, low cortisol. So what we want is we want our clients 
want to go to bed and cortisol low. That's what we want. But that's not what happens. They want to go to bed, but the cortisol, instead of being here, is here. Yeah. Now, that might mean like nothing to you, but the range of cortisol, and I've tested cortisol for over 15 years. Let's say we're here. That's 100%. If I'm even here, that's 200% above what it should be. And that's that person in bed thinking about work, accounts, business, you know, stress, that so-and-so on Instagram did this, whatever it is. And their brain is wired, but they're tired. And we need to reset that. And unfortunately, the body is, as we said, homeostasis. The body doesn't care how big your arms are, doesn't care how your abs look. They want you to keep it alive now. So the body can actually make more cortisol during the daytime to combat the stress that you're under. Mm -hmm. But we need cortisol, otherwise we would die. We need it here, we need it low here. We don't need it like this. Yeah. We certainly don't need it like this. Or we certainly don't want it like this. So again, but cortisol, is made in those factories that we talked about, particularly in the adrenal glands. It can be actually made in fat tissue as well. So if we have this cortisol and, we, and the factories know when to make it, brilliant. But if our factories are on Australian time or New Zealand time, well, then they don't know when to make it. And then yeah, no wonder yeah. people are aware, you know? And uh, without getting access to somebody blo somebody's bloods, but you, you know that their cortisol is high because they're having issues sleeping and they're, they're presenting with that. They're not wired and tired person. Um, <clears throat> and without, I hope this going against what you do, coming up with a, a bespoke plan, let's say, to help deal with that, those, to get those cortisol levels under control, what, is there anything you can do to maybe try and get people's cortisol levels to, to kind of drop off, or sorry, sorry uh, yeah, drop off uh, during, the, during the night time so then it can build up during the morning time? And don't get me wrong, I do test a lot of people. And the reason why I test some people is when people come in, they're like, oh, my cortisol isn't here or there. So I test them and I use, I use a test called a Dutch test, which is by far the, the leading oh, yes. test when it comes to a hormonal function. I test you over the whole day. But so if I suspect someone has a high cortisol or they're overwhelmed or they're under recovered or their stress management is, is poor, the first thing I do is everybody focuses here. Oh, I'm going to turn off my phone. I'm going to listen to meditation. I'm going to take magnesium. And in my opinion, excuse the French, bullshit. Bullshit. It doesn't work. We've all said to people, get off your phone, blue blocking glasses. We've all said, take a cold shower. We've said, go for a walk. And the fact is, Kieran, I've said that for years, and it just doesn't work. It's not powerful enough. Mm -hmm. And the reason being is the, home, the wave is here. I can't stop the wave because it started here. So the approach is to start here. You have to start off in the morning. If you want low cortisol at night time, you start off in the morning. And you need at least 14 days. The research says 10 days, but I always say 14 just so it gets over two weekends for people. And there's always a certain amount of outliners. So what you do in the morning is the, wolf, the few things that really make cortisol go up. So think of a seesaw. It doesn't work like that. But what I'm trying to do is if this is high at night time and this is low here, I want that. I, I, I want it to be high. So one thing that brings cortisol down in the morning is carbs. Carbs will categorically bring cortisol down. Cortisol is what's called a glucocorticoid. It brings blood sugar back up again. And in the presence of high blood sugar and insulin, cortisol will go down. So I don't want that. So when I want to get people cortisol balanced, carbs are gone in the morning. Mm -hmm. The next thing they do is they're called the zeitgebers. I don't, I don't come up with these words. I wish I did. But Zeitgebers is an exterior influence on your internal clock. So all those factories, they need to be told what time of the day it is. Like the, 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 the clocks went back or went forward, whatever. Uh, fall, back, fall back, spring forward, went back. Yeah, yeah. So now what we happen to do is get the clocks to know what time it is. So what, how do we regulate those clocks? And there's three major things that will regulate your clocks. Food. Food is a very strong Zeitgeber. This intermittent fasting crap, it's brilliant. Intermittent fasting is brilliant when your car is working brilliant, when your energy is great, when your metabolism is great. However, the majority of people, when they try intermittent fasting, what do they do? They Skip step. rest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, because it's easy to do. If you want to lose weight and you want to bring down the additional calories or snacks, skip dinner. It's much more effective, in my opinion. But anyway... So what we do is we cut carbs out of breakfast. So we're not bringing that cortisol down. The next thing we do, we get light exposure. 
Light exposure above 2,000 lux in your eye is a very good regulatory for the, for the retina and it tells the body to balance cortisol and melatonin. So really get your, it's just like, it's like an alarm clock. All right, guys, it's starting the day. Let's go, let's go. It gets all the factors going. And the next thing that I feel is very beneficial is exercise. Now, it doesn't have to be strenuous exercise. The research is clear. It's 20 minutes long. It has to be above around the 120 BPM, which you know and I know is not that hard. It's probably a brisk walk. It could be, you know, very light cycle. It could be some interval training in your bedroom. It could be sex if you're that way inclined for 20 minutes, whatever you want, I don't mind. But the fact is, get your heart rate up, get light exposure, get food in in the first hour. Then when it comes to nighttime, I'm a big fan of meditation apps. Calm is one of my most favorite ones. I'm a big fan of walking. Do not like exercise at nighttime. Exercise is very uh, stimulatory for cortisol, so I steer away from exercise at night time. I prefer my guys with that problem to exercise in the morning or as early in the evening as they can. Yeah, yeah. You do that for 14 days, it will dramatically change things. Now, if someone has a big neck, if someone has a, a deviated septum, if someone's got blocked sinuses, if someone's got a high waist to hip ratio, someone's got food allergies, no nasal polyps, they're snoring. That's a different situation we can yeah. talk about. But normally, this is a very effective way of getting cortisol balanced. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, you mentioned in there uh, at one stage about uh, a, a caloric deficit. Um, I'm not sure if it was in relation to the uh, intermittent fasting. Uh, but just kind of trying to move on to the next, uh, one of the next fundamentals being, being the nutrition side of things. Uh, <clears throat> everybody drives their calorie intake down. Yeah. And everybody drives their activity levels up because it, it works off of the premise that, you know, I drop my calories, I burn more than I take in, I'm going to lose weight, which look, it works. But I don't, people that come to a personal trainer, this is a funny thing, you're getting people that have done this and it, and it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and then you're trying to communicate to them that they've, they've tried this approach before and yet you're standing in my gym during a consultation, tell me you've been trying to lose weight and it's not working, yet you're fighting with me over me trying to encourage you to eat more food. Um, how, why does that happen? Right, so this, this, this is not a pet hate of mine, but a few things, so there's three sections I wanna cover on this, and I'll try and cover it as, as quick as I can. Number one, when someone's on a calorie deficit, so all food, and I, I, I'm going to say this as clear as I can, there's five classifications of food. Five, that's it. We have macronutrients, we have micronutrients, we have proteins, fats, and carbohydrates, we have vitamins and minerals. Every single uh, calorie deficit diet, every single one every, ever studied in the whole planet is a vitamin and mineral deficient diet, 100%. Anytime you cut one of these macronutrients, proteins, fats, and carbs, and in my opinion, it should mainly be carbs. When you cut any one of those three, vitamins and minerals go down. Okay. Vitamins and minerals are essential for coenzymes, cofactors, hormonal balance, brain function, neurotransmitter activation, everything. So you're, if you are on a calorie deficit diet and you're not addressing your micronutrients, you're pissing against the wind. You're not going to get the results. Yeah. Second thing. It was called the Pareto Principle. And the Pareto Principle is the 80-20 rule. I'm sure you've heard about it before. Now, 80% of people will cook calories, lose weight, no problem. Me and you, do never see, we never see those people. Yeah. Never see them. They never come to a specialist. However, we get the 20%. Mm -hmm. We get the 20% that try the calorie deficit, doesn't work. We try the exercise, and doesn't work. Now, when you have a car, and let's go back to the car analogy, you have your car. Your car is 31 years old. You're not a car. You're not a machine. How do we come up with calories? We put food into a calotrometer, we, we increase, we burnt it, we raise the water by one degree Celsius. We're not machines. 100 calories of broccoli is not 100 calories of monster drink. It's not 100 calories of Red Bull. It's not the same. No. So everybody's engine burns calories different. And your factory, your little factory inside your cell hasn't got a billy ocean what a calorie is. It no. knows a protein, a fat, a carb, a vitamin, a mineral. It doesn't know calorie. Calorie has been made from the outside unit of measurement. It's not an internal unit of measurement. It is so, something, sorry, I'm cutting across it. And, and again, I have this conversation with clients when I'm saying the calorie is not a calorie, although the people are following on social media, the calorie is a calorie. And the body sees food, it takes it in, and it 
it only wants what it can assimilate from the food. So whatever it can break down is what it wants. It doesn't want the, the 100 calories. It, it wants those vitamins and minerals you were talking about. It wants the protein, the fats and the carbs. Um, I, I'm going to mention protein because people just associate protein with muscles, but they don't understand you know, what's involved in your bones. It's involved in neurotransmitter formation. Um, it, it's not just about, I'm going to eat this protein and it's going to give me muscle, but I don't want to get muscly, so I'm not going to eat the protein. Um, unless you're eating sufficient amounts of protein, you're not going to get to build up muscle anyway if your body feels it's not getting what it needs to take care of the basic stuff. Um, you know, making sure that your body can produce these specific hormones so that you can function on a, on a normal level. And only when you're at that level will your body start using it to build lean tissue and then fat loss can kind of help. Well, that's the thing. Some, and this is the reason we're, we're taking this bodybuilding protein and oil, like the pump, the muscle, you know, the growth and repair. But that's not protein. The number two things protein does in the body is one, the immune system. All your immune soldiers are protein soldiers. Number two, all detoxification requires protein. So before you even go near getting jacked, protein is needed for that. Again, 70% of your brain is made up of fat. Over 50% of your hormones are made up of fat. They don't say that. Pe people get all bogged down with, oh, it's, it's nine kilocalories and this is... No, yeah, stop. Yeah. stop. And, and, and they're afraid to eat it then. So, so for me, when someone comes into me and I, I say, okay, this is where your car is now. You've got a lot of mileage. You've had a little bit of an off-road. You, your tires are off. Your engine is off. Let's focus on getting your metabolism right. And then... We can go on a calorie deficit. Mm -hmm. And even one of my even real pet hate is I have so many women come to me postnatal who are trying to lose weight. And what do they do after having a baby? They cut the calories and they over exercise. Absolute horse shit. They burn themselves out, their skin dries out, the libido goes down, their mood goes down, increased postnatal depression. They can't go back to their job, the brain isn't working. These people need to be given stuff, not stuff taken away from them. So again, that's largely down to the right amount of macronutrients and the correct vitamins and minerals. Yeah. Right? I, qu I question those people online that talk about calorie deficit. And one of the biggest proponents of calorie deficit is Lane Norton, Dr. Lane Norton. So he was in Dublin a couple of years ago. So I, I reached out to him. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm part of the OWSN convention uh, organization. I rang him. I said, look, you're in Dublin. Would you mind coming and doing a presentation at the gym? He said, no problem. Owen. He came. He did his presentation on the ball. Fella is a very educated guy, very knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Deals a lot with online clients, a lot with physique people. And I said, and I didn't want to challenge him as in uh, being aggressive. I just said, okay, but well, what about this? And he said, Owen, oh, it depends. And I said, well, what about this? And he goes, it depends. And then every question I ask him, he says, it depends. So even someone like him that is in the know, that's in if it fits your macros, it depends on the person. Yeah. So even him. So we are like, but that doesn't sell, look here on. You know, yeah. a diet saying, no. I'll give you a diet that's, I have to assess you though, and you ha I have to listen to you and talk to you and look at you and see how you poo and sleep. And people don't want to know that. They want to know, well, how do I look like horror? How do I look at yeah. Kim Kardashian? How do I do this? You know, and it's more scientific than that. But that, I, I see that as a positive and a negative. I see it as a negative because a lot of people are given misinformation that yes. doesn't work, that can be detrimental to health and well-being. But I see it as an opportunity for us to try to go to see people and help them because there's much more that can be done. This, this equation, this metabolic balance, don't eat this, over exercise, you lose weight. I can show you tons of labs on people that are eating less than a thousand calories a day, you know, training over 16 units of sessions a week and not losing weight. I've seen it. I've seen it. Right so. down. They've got polycystic ovarian syndrome. They've got endometriosis. They've got, you know, itel bell syndrome. They get Crohn's disease. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on, but just a calorie deficit. Yes, it works for 80% of the people. I'm not disagreeing with that, but I don't deal with those people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, you mentioned about achieving um, metabolic, but I'm not, not sure if it was balanced, but basically getting your metabolism to a, to a place where it can, it can work effectively. Yeah. Uh, what are your recommendations on, on achieving that? Okay. So we call it metabolic flexibility. So what happens is to certain body types, and I, I would be one of those guys, if, you, if you're familiar with somatotyping, I'd be a guy that could probably, I could get quite fat if I, if I ate bad food. So I, I don't get away with eating bad food. I've got other guys that can have pizzas all day, every day, and don't look like to put on weight. The same way is they find it hard to put on muscle where I might I get it a bit easier. So it, it swings in roundabouts. But what happens is it's all down to your carbohydrates and your metabolic tolerance. 
I want my clients to be able to eat well and maintain their weight. If they have a meal that's off the diet or off the regime, they bounce back again. I like to th trying to keep the car analysis or analogy. I want them to be a hybrid. I want them to burn petrol when it's there, but go back to burning fat or electricity when they're not. Yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of people come in to see me, they're not efficient fat burners. Yeah. And to burn fat, you need to be metabolically efficient. So first of all, what we need is, in order for any fat to be burnt in the body, we need oxygen. Okay, so let me say it again. You need oxygen in order to, to fuel that fat flame. Now, that fat flame needs to be energy brought in. If you're anemic and you're not delivering oxygen, you're not burning fat if you need oxygen. The next thing we need is, is a transportation enzyme. It's called carnitine acyl transferase one and two. The name's not important, but it's made from carnitine. So carnitine brings fat into the fire to be burned. It has a cofactor, which is magnesium, that does that with it. So if you're magnesium deficient, and if you're carnitine deficient, and you're anemic, like, yeah. well, like what are you doing? And I, I say to people all the time, I have a client, she's, she's an amazing client, I have her nearly 13 years, the end of this year will be 13 years. Now, and, and she trains with me three to four times a week, not now obviously, but three to four times a week, and that's my best client. I don't have any client with me training five days a week, maybe you have. But if you have a client training five days a week, that only represents 2.9% of the week. That's it. Five hours a week represents 2.9% of the week. That is not enough for your body to change. So it has to be complemented with nutrition, complemented with sleep, complemented with carbohydrate, complement control or cycling as I like to call it. It needs to have adequate protein. So what I have is an ABC approach. It goes into D, E and F, but that's too long. A is adequate protein. Your protein intake and my protein intake is different. different. I don't know how well you absorb it. A friend of mine, Dr. Jose Antonio, showed that you can consume 4.4 grams of protein per pound of body weight and still have no adverse effects in your kidneys and liver. He showed that. But I said to him, I said, Jose, how much meat is that? He said, oh, it's not meat. They're drinking it. Well, drinking protein and eating protein is not the same. Oh, so really he's a very good researcher, but he just did that to prove that protein isn't going to cause these kidney yeah. reaction issues. So adequate protein. You need adequate protein. What is that for you? I don't know. Guess how I know? I give you X amount. See how your muscle mass changes. See how your energy is. See how your weight is. See how you're feeling in the gym. Next thing is B stands for balancing your fats. We need to balance our fats. Everyone has too much omega-6s not enough quality oils so we balance the, the, the fats and c is a control and cycle carbohydrates we need carbs i'm not saying we shouldn't have carbs i think people should have carbs in their diet but not at breakfast if sleep is an issue after training if they're trained hard enough and, and if they're going to have it every weekend anyway well then i might take it out during the week yeah and it, actually this just takes us back to the sleep thing uh, you were saying carbs bring your cortisol down yeah so it's a good thing to have at night time in the evening? Carbs are my dinner time. It's serotonin and melatonin help you in sleep. It's brilliant. And I like low glyc I like rice, sweet potato, yeah. quinoa. I'm on the fence about quinoa, I'll be honest with you. I heard, I'm getting a lot of conflicting feedback from quinoa. It can be very easy to digest for some people and a lot harder for other people. But carbs at night time. And I have, um, I have a look at, so more meat and more fat at breakfast, less meat and less fat at dinner. Yeah. Low carbs at breakfast, more carbs at dinner. Yeah. Try to make it simple for people to follow, you know? And just uh, putting it then forward to what we were just talking about, you mentioned carnitine, magnesium, and yeah. iron. Well, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't supplement with iron. Uh, giving someone iron will constipate them. And yeah. women have a major issue. I could, I could hang my hat on, on my career on, on dysbiosis and IBS for women. Mm -hmm. But I don't give them iron. But what I will do is I'll recommend red meat twice a week. Yeah, now, but that's what I was getting at. So, it's that your, your main source of those three things will be red meat. But what we're seeing now at the moment is go away from red meat. Yeah. Um, now, I'm not saying like I, I told a client there the other day that I have red meat probably two or three times a week. And like he came back at me going, That's too much. <laughs> what do you mean? That's too much. Um, yeah. And it's a big problem. The problem is there has been a lot of, a lot of controversy and this game changer. Uh, Netflix documentary didn't help at all. I'm sure you got shit over that as much as I did. But the fact is, it wasn't, you know, a scientifically, you know, supported, well validated research being presented in the documentary. However, red meat, processed red meat is terrible for you. 
processed meat in general is terrible for you. But the, the, the word process in there, anytime anything is taken from being dead to being sold, it has to go through a processing system. Some are more pressed, processed for shelf life and colors and so on. But for me, quality, good, organic, free range, red meat twice a week. I like minced meat. I like carpaccio for a lot of people. I like steak as much as I like to make, mix in minced meat. So turkey mince, lamb meat, mince, uh, beef mince in a, in a rotation can be very beneficial for f- females. Yeah. Now, in some situation, I might need to give them an iron supplement. But this is the thing. There's over 27 different forms of anemia. People think anemia, iron. That's all they think about. But it could be B12 anemia, B9 anemia, B6 anemia, copper uh, can cause anemia. So there's loads of different issues that could be caused by it. So it's not just iron all the time. And women, this is an interesting topic. So one of the things I, I, I found out maybe four or five years ago, I was talking to, to Dr. Brian Walsh, a good friend of mine. And he, he's seen when people's uh, hemoglobin is low, hemoglobin is like the bus that brings, uh, the protein carrier that brings iron and oxygen around the body. He started to find that that was low on people. So he came up with the system, production, destruction, or loss. We're not producing it, we're breaking it down too much, or we're losing it. So you can lose iron in the body and hemoglobin from internal bleeding. I really hope that's not the issue. The next thing you can do from having your menstrual cycle, if it's heavy, you're gonna lose blood every single month. Destruction, well, how could you be breaking down red blood cells? And he showed that people that do a lot of running when their foot hits the ground, they break up a lot of hemoglobin. So the more you run, the more you break down hemoglobin. So one, your production. If you're not eating iron, B9, B12, which is not that absorbable from vegetables, just so you know that. And I was at a seminar with a guy and he had a great quote. He says, oh, vegetables don't have teeth. I'm going, where, where are you going with this? And he says, vegetables don't have teeth. So in order for them to defend about being eaten and digested by an animal, they make it very hard to be broken down. So if they get you know, removed from the animal's body, they can reseed and grow again. So food that's raw is very hard to break down. And people on this raw diet, yeah. and that's very challenging from a roughage and from a cellulose point of view to break food down. So we're not eating the food, we're not producing it. If we're running a lot, we're going to get a lot of destruction. And if we're um, break, if we're losing it from internal bleeding or menstrual cycle, we have three double whammies, which is why you're anemic. But one of the biggest complaints I get when people come in the door is, I'm wrecked on. Yeah. And what are these people doing? Training six times a week, cutting the calories down. Like, for me, I say to them, okay, well, you're doing this, you're cutting the calories, you're training, and it's not happening. Give me a month. Give me a month of doing something different. Let's try and make you feel better. Let's get your energy. Let's get your sleep better. Let's get some good food in. And then at the end of the month, I'll kick the ass off you in the gym. No problem. Yeah, yeah. But now let's, let's do a bit of an MOT. Let's get a checklist. Sleep. Yes. Hydration. Yes. Macronutrient control, carb cycling, your ABC. Then we get you on a multivitamin, a basic multivitamin. And then we train you as hard as you can recover. Mm-hmm. Not as hard as I can do. I can shout down you on a Zoom console. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you would mentioned, this leads us nicely into the training part of things. Um, you, yeah, you men- mentioned running. Um, it's probably, uh, I don't know, again, I would deal with a similar clientele in terms of age as yourself. Um, pretty much over, over 30, 40s, uh, uh, and people in their 50s. Um, less so young people. people I, don't know, I don't know if it's a, I want to avoid saying this, a midlife crisis thing where people just turn to running. They turn to marathons. Now I'm not talking about 5Ks. I actually like clients to do 5Ks, but it's a short amount of time and they can improve their time rather than extent of distance. Yeah. Um, but let's say endurance levels, uh, pushing towards half marathons, stuff like that, and the, the, the impact that that may have on the body when looking to facilitate weight loss because not everybody loses weight by, by simply just pounding the pavement. No. So uh, again, you swear, you swear I prepped this beforehand, but think of this car, right? We're focusing on rebuilding this car. The first thing we talk about the goal test and intelligence, what's your client's goal? Okay. So running, when you improve running, and also I'm going to put cycling in there because I've got a lot of guys that love cycling. And um, when you're cycling on the bike and when you're outside running, what's the goal of your running? And I'm, I'm sorry to say this, it's not health well-being, fitness, fat loss. It's enjoyment. They run, a lot of the my clients run yeah. for headspace. They run to clear their head. They cycle because they, they get a bit of activity the weekend and they like it with their friends. 
brilliant go for it do it however this is your health journey we're going here and you're cycling here it's not the same destination i've got guys that can do or like i have a guy in the weekend <laughs> online um like Kieran, his name was, believe it or not. And he goes, ah, I do a bit of running the weekend. I said, I'm talking to Kieran, well, how much distance do you do? Ah, I did 180 kilometers the weekend. I'm like, we on a motorbike? He goes, no. <laughs> so that's not a bit of, but the fella still has a lot of weight to lose. Yeah, 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 but, yeah. And what happens is the body becomes economical of burning less calories. That's how we get fitter. We yeah. get better able to do the same activity at lower calorie expenditure. We get more aerobically fit you know, and so on. So running, in my opinion, and, and I like your, your 5K analysis, doing a 5K, getting faster, doing it in a better time, no problem. I like to go and do a 5K every now and again. I have no issue with that. But it's the longer distance, the accumulation of the stress on the knee, the stress in the lower back, the breakdown of hemoglobin. And if you were to do that sprint, jog, sprint, jog, that's different altogether. But it, it, I let people know that... The, you're investing an hour or two hours into training. That is, you're doing that for enjoyment. You're doing that for headspace. You are not doing that for body composition changes. Mm -hmm. And once they know that, they tend to still do it, but at a very, very less degree. If yep. you're training three days in the week and going out for a long cycle at the weekend, I actually prefer cycling than, than running. If you're mm -hmm. outside running the short distance, no problem. But realize that running will not get you to the body composition, fitness, strength, mobility, bone, ligament, muscle, instant sensitivity that we're looking for. Yeah, I think that, that might be a topic for the future on uh, just the, the caloric requirements and, and micronutrient requirements for people that do those endurance kind of, because uh, they're not athletes. Like these are people that are, that, that are working in an office, high demanding jobs, and then they're like training for a marathon, which uh, takes up, absorbs so much time. And then they're eating less than I eat. And like, now look, I'm an on one or two clients in the, the sheer amount of volume of work that they can get through in a week on like no food in comparison to the amount that, that's running. But again, we'll, we'll come back to that at another time. That's a, that's a whole other talk. On that one, one short topic. So every time you contract the muscle, you need calcium. Every time you relax the muscle, you need magnesium. Now, magnesium, I have a friend of mine, Dr. Serrano, I love him. He's a great guy, but he comes out with some funny quotes every now and again. And he says, because God, because God said so. Now, you can't come back to someone that said that God said so. But magnesium is in the hot, the only food magnesium is really in to any substantial quantity is carbs. Mm -hmm. Right? So when people run a lot, they lose magnesium from the contraction relaxation. They also lose a lot of it through sweat. Now, as I said, magnesium is a cold factor with carnitine, ACL transferase one and two for the bringing in of fat for better oxidation in your cells. So if you don't have magnesium, you're not eating it, you're sweating it out and you're using it up. It means that you're not going to recover the same way. The same guys have twitches, have spasms, have cramps, and that can cause a lot of issues, headaches, brain fog. So again, yeah. running in itself and every sport, and this is something that I, I talk a lot about, when people are doing running, is a repetitive nature in running. There's a repetitive rate nature in any sport, soccer, rugby, tennis, golf. It's all repetitive with movements. There's a certain physical demand, there's a certain chemical and nutritional demand on every single movement that you do. And unfortunately, people are running and not complementing themselves with the antioxidants, the trace minerals, the electrolytes, and the protein needed to recover from training. So they're training, and they're actually wearing themselves down. You see yeah. these people, and their face, their collagen, their elasticity, in their skin all changes. Their metabolic rate changes. Their resting heart rate goes down because their, their, their stroke volume and cardiac output is improving. But that's, that's it, you know? Yeah. And one thing before I got off the soapbox, this business of doing cardio, there's no such thing as cardio. The day you stop doing cardio, the day you die, right? So people think, oh, I don't, you don't do any cardio. I do circuit training. I do jujitsu, boxing, running, okay. assault bike. That's all cardio. Cardio, in my opinion, is long, steady state cardio for in excess of an hour. So this thing of not doing cardio, you are doing cardio. You need to look at the cardiovascular, the cardiorespiratory system, and you can do that in conjunction with muscular training. Ah, thanks a million. Do you mind if I just fire on a couple of client questions to you before we awesome. wrap this up? Um, yeah, actually, we just tapped on that one. Chronic deficit and no fat loss. Um, yeah, we th that one was addressed there. Um, recommended protein levels and frequency for, for okay, fat so loss. The first thing is adequate protein. One, you find out where you currently are. You can't recommend anybody, and I say this across the bat, for any recommendation for grammage or for caloric intake. You need to see where somebody is first 
and then I increase it up. What I prefer to do is have protein at breakfast, lunch, and a smaller bit at dinner throughout the daytime. Um, and base your energy and your muscle mass on increasing your protein up. But if you increase protein up, I don't want, this is the key thing, I don't want protein for energy. I don't. Yeah. I want fat for energy, I want protein and amino acids for building blocks. So for me, I'll have at least three protein, solid protein sources during the daytime, and I'll have one amino acid drink around training. How, you, how, many, of those, uh, how many of those are protein bars on? Protein bars are for losers. Right, uh, protein bars, protein, like, you know, whey protein for losers. They're, they're, it's crap. It's first of all, it's whey protein. Protein bars. Give me if you want to have a bar, have a Snickers, have a Mars bar, have a bar. Having a protein bar doesn't make it any healthier. Still rubbish. I hooked you on that one. I know you did. Yeah. <laughs> um. All right. This this is a male client of mine who he, he's he's a proper insomniac. He's he right. sleeps. You're talking uh, since I've known him and. 10 years prior to this three four hours sleep uh he, he trains well he's an animal and um, he's a big lad he's, he's he's six foot he's broad um but he's he sleeps shit there's digestive issues there he takes melatonin um and something that i've just added in here he's, he's quite slow to recover from injury so any recommendations so this guy here he's, he's sma he smashes the train and does he he can, yeah. I, I hold him back. I tried to hold him back and he's like, put more weight on. Make him go harder on this. Uh, and it's I'm trying to communicate to him that there's there's other things we need to address because the training is fine. So the, I have a talk on, on my website on, on sleep. Oh, you're not pushing that, but what I'm saying is it goes into a lot of detail on that. The first thing I would do with him is what's called a sleep spread. Now, the sleep spread is the most, I'm going to say aggressive or intensive sleep intense. spread. You what? It's intense. Have you, have you seen it? No, I've heard you talk about it. It's intense. Yeah, so the 14 and 12, and then you, you bring it out. It's hard. If he did that for one week, game changer for him. Yeah. It's just that he will not get the results he's looking for in the gym while his sleep is dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. um, people go off and do sleep studies, and in my opinion, a sleep study of questions about it. Is he fat? Is he, is he got a big neck? No? Can he breathe through his nose? Yeah, as far as I'm aware, yeah. Okay, so if you can breathe through his nose, I might look into mouth taping. I would also look into doing a sleep spread. But he needs two weeks, two weeks of focusing on his sleep, and then start training a bit harder. But can you just briefly explain that sleep spread then? Okay, so what it is, you start off at 12 and 4 o'clock in the morning. You stay up at 12 o'clock at night, which is easy to do for anybody, but you have to get up at 4 o'clock in the daytime, and you do not go back to sleep until you come around to 12 o'clock the next day. So you go 12 to four, once you've gone continuously through four, 12 o'clock to four o'clock, you expand it by 15 minutes either side. So 11.45, 4.15. Once that's continuous, 11.30, 4.30. Once that's continuous, 11.15, 4.45 and so on. But it has to be continuous. And what it does is it helps regulate that cortisol high in the morning, low at night time to low sleep drive to high sleep drive. Yeah. Brilliant. Please don't do it if you're an Aer Lingus pilot or a crane yeah, pilot yeah. or a surgeon. The 4L pilots won't be flying that much at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah and then this, the importance of consistent sleep for weight loss. Uh, disrupted sleep, maybe four hours one day, but then he gets eight hours the next day. Uh, he might get four hours and he wakes for a couple and goes back for three. Um, yeah, but, but again. That, that, that's all circadian clock resetting. If he sticks or he or she sticks themselves on a, on a sleep routine or sleep hygiene, same time in the morning, same time at night time. Now, for me, the night time tends to be the one that challenges people the most because they, they don't fall asleep in bed. However, if you're consistently getting up early, the body will say, oh, geez, I'm wrecked. I'm going to go to sleep. You cannot nap. You cannot nap. So what you have is what's called REM latency, where you go to sleep and get into REM sleep faster. If you nap, you prolong that at night time. You cannot nap. Okay, brilliant. Uh, and then one more, uh, again, a client example. Um, 50, 54, 55-year-old female, um, bacterial overgrowth issues, SIBO, H. Pyori. -like. Um, she, she's great. She, she, trains, she trains regularly. She loves the gym. Uh, she's been trying to take control of the food side of things, but she can't because of the digestive issues. Yeah. Um, but her sleep's horrendous. So she's yeah. been trying to tick these different boxes, and that, that's what I'm tr trying to encourage her to do. She's, she's tried to address the food. She's tried to address the, the, the exercise. Um, I'm trying to push her on somebody to, to go get bloods done. Um, but I notice sleep is a big contributing factor. 
Um, do you, I know you'd have to kind of basically assess her, but do you feel that if she was to gain control of sleep, that eventually it might have that positive knock-on effect with the other things? Uh, obviously, she's she's taken certain things for the SIBO and the and the H prior line and things like that. Right. So yeah. So so SIBO or small intestinal bacteria overgrowth and, and H pylori go hand in hand. So she needs to get rid of the H pylori force off the bat. And there's a medication called treble therapy. Is she on that? Yeah. Okay. So she needs to get through the treble therapy. Then when it comes to the SIBO, she needs digestive enzymes straight off the bat. Digestive enzymes in particular with ox boil to keep her gallbladder moving and keep the boil moving on from there. Once that's addressed. What you need to do is when, when H. pylori particularly affects how the body makes intrinsic factor and hydrochloric acid. So food moving forward, I would go more towards bone broth, soups, chowders, um, you know, food that's broken down, mincemeat, so she can absorb them much easier. I would start off on a higher caloric day, the start of the day, as in a big meal, let's say, let's say uh, 60, 20, 20 or something like that, as in a percentage shift. And training wise, training is low intensity. Yeah. High intensity interval training or high training will cause a little bit of leaky gut and maybe slow down our process. Mm -hmm. And then only after a month of doing that would I add in some uh, potent probiotic. One of the best probiotics I've found for SIBO in particular is what's called VSL. VSL you can get on Amazon now, it's 450 billion. A colony okay. unit. It's a serious, serious probiotic. So once she gets the H. pylori eradicated, she works on the SIBO, make sure she takes digestive enzymes, uh, split her caloric intake into higher in the morning, lower in lunchtime, very low at dinner time, low steady state cardio, maybe some interval training, some corrective work for a month. And then once she's over that, then we can start pushing her a bit harder in the gym. Okay. Right. Appreciate it. Um, and last one, just you, you mentioned uh, supplementation. Um, pe <laughs> people always try to buy the cheapest supplement and Holland Barrett is probably the cheapest place that they'll, that they'll get it in. Um, and I'm always trying to encourage them about the, 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 the quality of supplements. So I, I, I base a lot of stuff off of Labdoor. Uh, they're a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it's an unbiased assessment of the quality of the products. Um, like it does the quality of supplement matter. Well, th this is the thing, right? So, so I was in, where was I? I was in Holland and Barrett buying um, toothpaste there recently. They do this allodent fluoride free toothpaste. And for, for the crack, I took a picture of the fish oil. So the fish oil, first of all, on the back of the label, I had the EPA and DHA content of the fish oil. So I added it up and it came to just over 300. I'm going, well, 300 milligrams per 1,000 grams, which is 30% of this fish oil, was fish oil. Now, on top of the serving size, it had three capsules, yeah. which means that that 300 grams was based, that 300 milligrams or 30% being fish oil was based over three tablets. Mm -hmm. Holland the Barrett is, a, is terrible for supplements. And what, me, what I mean by that is if I was to recommend the Nutri or pure encapsulations or a Zymogen or Metagenics, at least 70 to 80% of each tablet is fish oil. So if you give someone three fish oil tablets from Holland and Barrett, that equals 30 or 300 milligrams. Where if I gave you one capsule of another one, it's two and a half times that. So the quality of the supplements is 100%. And the issue that I have with that is, let's say you have a headache. Mm -hmm. And clients are very, very you know, intuitive to what when they take something. They take a paracetamol or a, a sulpidine and their headache goes away. Pill, pain, solution. When they go multi take it, no difference, ah, that multi didn't work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, they see multi as all the same things. I have this, this joke I talk about my mom. I gave my mom these uh, multi vitamins. There were six a day, they're called multi intense. And you get a good month of them and then you move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the house and I'm talking to my mom, I'm like, Jenny Mac, you got loads of these multis left. What's going on? She goes, aha, I realize if I take one a day, they last longer. I'm like, oh Jesus, man. <laughs> That's not how it works. So <laughs> the potency is there for a reason. And if you think of like my wadi, right? You think of my wadi or, or, or a Dioraloid or um, any one of those Robinsons, you put it in water because that's so concentrated, it disperses yeah. very fast in a glass of water. The higher concentration you have of vitamins in the body, it will be absorbed much faster. But Holland and Barrett, Centrum, well woman, well man. No, 
Yeah. The same people will go and have go for dinner at Kieran and buy Sansa or Flory wine, 50, 60, 70 euro, and not bad an eyelid. Yeah. You know? But when it comes to the vitamin that they're, they're being cost effective in the saving, and if you think being healthy is expensive, try being sick. Yeah. And see how expensive that is. <laughs> so invest in your health, invest in your supplements. And that's why I, one of the reasons why I stopped selling supplements because people thought I was actually trying to sell what I have. I don't care. Yeah. I have four or five brands I like. I send it to the websites and people go from there. All right, brilliant. Uh, yeah, I think that's a, a, a good note to finish on, invest in your health. Um, really appreciate you uh, taking the time this morning. It was really good, loads of good content. Clients are going to enjoy it. Uh, and if anybody wants to reach out to Owen, uh, ownlaceyeducation.com. That's Owen the, .com. the courses or on Instagram is the same thing. Perfect, perfect. Owen, thanks, William. Gentlemen, really. No problem, really all, Take it easy. Talk to you soon. Bye, bye, bye.